Kat. I'm Taylor. And welcome to Square Mile of Murder. This is our second and final episode on the Long Island serial killer, also known as the Lisk. Uh, so we're picking it up this week with the investigation and the suspects. So let's go straight back to it. Yeah. And if you haven't heard the first part, maybe do that first. Yeah, that would be good. Just I don't know. Maybe maybe you can pick it up from context, but it's probably a good idea to go back. Yeah. Some of the some of the background might be <laughs> valuable to have there. We mentioned in part one, so if you again, you know, this is your last chance. Um so we mentioned in part one that there was a long list of potential suspects for these crimes, beginning with those close to the women, like drivers, boyfriends, clients. Uh, but due to the anonymous nature of Craigslist and similar websites and the use of burner phones and throwaway accounts, it was difficult for authorities to track down many of the clients and other people involved in the women's lives. However, there are four main suspects who appear across many different sources on this case, two of whom have been ruled out and another two who still have many questions hanging over them and potentially even more victims. And now, before we get too far in here, we need to stress slash issue a, a, a disclaimer, if you will, that nobody has been charged with the murders or conclusively identified as being the Long Island serial killer. These men have either have all either been designated as official suspects or persons of interest by the police or identified by the media or those close to the victims and investigated and cleared by law enforcement. So, one of the first suspects was Joseph Brewer. He was the client who Shannon Gilbert had visited at Oak Beach on the night she disappeared. Brewer was one of the last people to see Shannon alive or last known people, to see Shannon alive. And it was inside his house where Shannon made her frantic 911 call claiming someone was trying to kill her. Now, as we mentioned last week, Brewer claimed that neither he nor Shannon had taken any drugs. They hadn't even had sex that night. All he wanted was a bit of company, companionship. Mm -hmm. Uh, He was investigated by the police and quickly cleared as a suspect. But it is interesting that Brewer was considered a suspect of, you know, being the Long Island serial killer, even though as far as the public are aware, at least, he only ever used Shannon's services and none of the other women, the other victims. But Shannon isn't considered an official victim Mm -hmm. of the Long Island serial killer as her death was ruled death by mis- misadventure due to drowning. That's right. Um, and she is in that category of potential subject, uh, potential victims. Yeah. Um, and even though the ru- official ruling is contested and there isn't a second autopsy, but even that is also contested. So like, it's interesting. Mm-hmm. That he's one of the sort of first suspects, despite her not being classed as a victim in this case, and him having no known link to any of the other victims. Yeah. Uh, similarly, Shannon's driver, Michael Pack, who was also present the night that she vanished, was also cleared of any involvement in her death. Uh, the second person of interest who has now been cleared. Uh, that we'll look at is Peter Hackett, who interestingly, like Joseph Brewer, has only been linked to Shannon Gilbert. Uh, None of the other victims are known to have any contact or interaction with Hackett. So Peter Hackett lived in the same gated community in Oak Beach that uh, where Joseph Brewer lived and was one of Brewer's neighbors when Shannon Gilbert disappeared. Uh, If you've read the book Lost Girls and Unsolved American Mystery by journalist Robert Kolker or seen the film Lost Girls on Netflix, which is based on the book, you probably will have heard Peter Hackett's name mentioned a lot in relation to Shannon's disappearance and subsequent death. Um, On May 2010, just two days after Shannon Gilbert disappeared, 
Peter Hackett phoned Shannon's mother, Mary, and told her that he, quote, ran a home for wayward girls and that he was taking care of Shannon and had given her medi medication because she was, quote, distressed. Or at least that's the version of events according to Mary Gilbert. Yeah. So Hackett is described as a former physician who had previously worked as a police surgeon in Suffolk County, Long Island. So the claims uh, made by Mary Gilbert uh, have been both confirmed and disputed by various neighbours, according to an article by Vice, which is linked in the episode description. Some say Hackett told them that he had treated Shannon Gilbert, whilst others call those neighbours crazy. Mm. So... Not a lot of agreement in Oak Beach as to what happened. <laughs> but that's not the end of Hackett's alleged involvement in this case. So three days after he made the initial phone call to Mary Gilbert, telling her that he was treating her daughter, Hackett made a second call to Shannon's mother, this time to tell her that he had never had any contact with her or Shannon. Hackett then denied that he had made either of the two phone calls, or at least he did until phone records proved that he had made two calls to Shannon's mother three days apart. After these phone records showed that he'd made the two calls, Hackett once again denied that he had told Mary he had any contact with Shannon or administered any drugs to her. He also denied claiming that he ran a home for, quote, wayward girl. According to that Vice article, he eventually admitted to making the phone calls, but once again denied ever meeting or administering drugs to Shannon. Um, and we couldn't find out what Hackett says those phone calls were about. Yeah, that's interesting that like, he's finally admitted. Well, he has to admit because the phone records the phone, prove yeah. that there were phone calls made to Shannon's mother, but he's ne never publicly divulged what they're actually about. Yeah. It, it is. It is weird that, mm. like, what? Why would he call her mother? Well, we're about to find out. So, in November 2012, almost a year after Shannon's body was found, uh, Murray Gilbert filed a wrongful wrongful death lawsuit against Peter Hackett, claiming he took Shannon into his home and administered the drugs that facilitated her death. Mary Gilbert also filed suit against the Suffolk County Police Department to try and uncover more information and answers about her daughter's death. Unfortunately, Mary would never get those answers as she was murdered in July 2016. But in 2020, a judge finally ordered Suffolk County Police to release more information, including Shannon's 911 call. The lawsuit against Peter Hackett was quickly dismissed too, because there was no proof that he had had any contact or administered sedatives to Shannon. Mm. Um, police eventually ruled Peter Hackett out as a suspect in any of the deaths associated with the Long Island serial killer after they revealed that Hackett had a history of inserting himself into or exaggerating his role in local events and in police investigations. Ah, oh, so he's one of those. Yeah. Yikes. But despite that and despite being ruled out by the police, he is still in like the, you know, like web sleuth mm -hmm. kind of community. He's still reportedly a very decisive figure. Hmm. And a lot of people still think he had something to do with it. Which, you know, when you're ringing up a victim's mother and saying, oh, yeah, she's in my home, I gave her some sedatives. Yeah. And he, he also very soon left Oak Beach as well and lives elsewhere in the US now. Now, we said at the beginning that there were four main suspects in this case, but there is a fifth who we'll mention quickly now before we go on to talk about the final two. Um, now, this man is one who we've only come across on Wikipedia and a Den of Geek article about uh, what the Netflix film Lost Girls missed out about the case, uh, which is the citation used on the Wikipedia page. And now this suspect was named James Bissett and he owned a garden center and nursery on Long Island. 
which was the main supplier of burlap in the region. Um, interesting claim yeah. to fame. Uh, yeah. And now whether that region refers to Long Island as a whole or Suffolk County more specifically, we're not sure, but like big in burlap on Long Island. <laughs> yeah, it, it, that's a very weird claim to fame. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, yeah. Good for them. Yeah. Um, James Bissett took his own life two days after Shannon Gilbert's body was found in December 2011. The main link between Bissett and the Lisk's victims is that many of the bodies were wrapped in burlap before being disposed of along the parkway. But that's it. That's the connection. Um, we didn't come across anything more detailed or any other evidence pointing towards Bissett in any of the other sources that we used researching this episode. So it kind of seems to be a tenuous link between him being a the main supplier of burlap and him taking his own life after one of the victims was found. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's it's very strange because yeah. <sighs> unless unless he like was supplying massive amounts of burlap to one specific one person. One person. Yeah. But we also have to remember that what the public knows and what the police knows are very very different. And there's a lot of stuff that we don't find out. It's it's a very strange inclusion. And also, like, these crimes took place over an extended period of time. So it's mm. not like someone showed up to the garden center and was like, hey, I would like 15, you know, X length rolls of burlap or what. I don't know how you buy burlap. I haven't done that recently or ever, but... No, I don't either. It's not like someone was stockpiling burlap necessarily from the get-go. It's probably more of a, you know, a potato sack here and a a sheet of it yeah. there. And, like, also, it, co it could be an indication that, like, that was a material that was readily available at the killer's job. Yeah. So, I mean, and yes... He's the supplier, so it's readily available at his job, but it could also be any number of other industries as well. Yeah, and it's not just like a garden or the potato industry. Like there's loads Use of like, for everything. Yeah. So any kind of any kind of construction or like um sort of trade yeah. jobs. Because it's it's this, a hard this... wearing material, so like yeah. it gets used a lot. I think more than people necessarily realize. Yeah, but yeah, it, it it's interesting. Yeah. Um. So, a profile of the killer was created, and one of the aspects of this profile was that the killer would have detailed knowledge of the area as well as knowledge of law enforcement technique. <laughs> techniques. Technique? Techniques. Um, as well as knowledge of law enforcement techniques and procedures, and access to burlap sacks, obviously. <laughs> um, we have spoken before uh, several times in different episodes about the dangers of investigators trying to find a murderer who fits a profile exactly rather than just using it as a guide. So that's... Yeah, I think our first ever episodes, we talked about that a lot. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I mean, we don't recommend you listen to them. No, don't listen. Do not. Do but... not do that. <laughs> well, yeah. Profiling can be an, a really useful tool in combination with a lot of other tools it shouldn't be the only thing yeah it shouldn't be the be all and end all um so the next suspect we are going to talk about is former suffolk county police chief james burke hi 
This is editing Taylor breaking in here for a second. Uh, you're about to listen to a portion of this episode that talks a little bit about this deep dive podcast series called Unraveled, which uh, presents a, a theory of this case and, and presents a suspect, potential suspect. Now, in the intervening days between recording this episode and editing it, I have learned that one of the hosts of this podcast has been accused of uh, sexual misconduct and sexual assault. So with that in mind, and with a desire not to uh, give this person a platform, or at least not more of a platform than they already have, um, we won't be linking to this show in the show notes as we normally would do. If you want to go listen to it, by all means, but we just don't want to link to it. Um, I'm leaving the section where we talk about the show in, and we may mention the podcast um, throughout the rest of the episode as well, but I just wanted to be transparent about the fact that we will not be linking to this podcast. Um, and so, you know, we just want to let you guys make your own decisions. Uh, okay, back to the show. Now, there is a really good deep dive podcast that goes into James Burke's alleged slash potential involvement in the Long Island serial killer case and includes information from other sex workers who claim to have been assaulted by Burke or witnessed him assaulting other women. He is also accused of having inappropriate and violent relationships with sex workers in Suffolk County and we believe that these relationships are termed inappropriate due to like the power imbalance mm. of him being a police chief and the women he allegedly had relationships with being sex workers you know who he could just arrest if he felt like it like that's yeah. a huge power imbalance there yeah absolutely however we should add that burke has never been charged with abusing his power in this way and that seemingly everyone including the fbi have declined to comment in 2016, James Burke was sentenced to almost four years for assault and conspiracy to obst obstruct justice after he assaulted a man in police custody who had stolen a duffel bag from him, uh, which contained sex toys, Viagra and pornography. Oh. Two Suffolk County prosecutors were also convicted as part of this conspiracy to obstruct justice by covering up Burke's crimes. There are also claims, again, unproven, uh, you know, nothing, nothing is uh, for definite, but there are claims that while he was police chief, Burke made attempts to block an FBI investigation into the Long Island serial killer. Further fuel is then added to the fire when looking at Burke's teenage years when he testified against his friends in the murder of 13-year-old John Pius in 1973. Questions have been asked about whether or not Burke may have been more complicit in the murder of John Pius. Again, he has not been charged or convicted, mm. nothing. You know, it's all alleged and accusations and maybes. Mm -hmm. um, and the prosecutor on that case under the murder of John Pius in 1973, Thomas Spoda was one of the prosecutors convicted as part of the conspiracy to obstruct justice and cover up Burke's crimes in 2016. He's also believed to be sort of instrumental in Burke's rise through um, Suffolk County police ranks. Mm. And as I said, the Unraveled podcast does go into more detail on Burke's life much more than we'd even have time to cover in an episode. But from what we've read and what we understand about this case, it does seem that arguments against James Burke are uh, circumstantial. And there's no concrete or forensic evidence against him, and nor has he been charged with any offences related to the Long Island serial killer. And of course, he has denied them all, all accusations anyway. But yeah. there's no one has tried to charge him with them, so... 
the fifth and final of the, quote, most popular suspects, for lack of a better term, is... We're going to have to come up with a better term. I know. Um... Because favorite doesn't sound any better. No. It's like it's like something you can get away with on like like a DB Cooper episode, but yeah, <laughs> not so much this one. Yeah. Um, most commonly named suspects, yeah. or su- I don't know. We'll we'll think on that. We'll get back to you. Mm. Um. So, yep, the final one we're going to talk about is convicted murderer John Bitrolf. In 2017, Bitrolf was convicted of the murders of Rita Tangredi and and Colleen McNamee or McNamee. We're not sure. Um, they were found murdered in Suffolk County in November 1993 and January 1994, respectively. He was also suspected of murdering Sandra Costillo, who was murdered in uh, Suffolk County in November 1993. Bitrolf was apprehended after a DNA sample provided by his brother in an unrelated case was partially matched to a profile removed from the bodies of Rita and Colleen. Rita Tangredi was known by police to be a sex worker, and Colleen McNamee was believed by authorities to also have been a sex worker. We don't know a lot about this case or about the victims, but at first glance, um, as sex workers on Long Island, they do fit the same basic profile of the Long Island serial killer's other victims. In September 2017, Bitrolf was sentenced to two consecutive sentences of 25 years to life. The first victim linked to the Long Island serial killer was found in 1996, known as Fire Island Jane Doe, due to her partial remains being found on Fire Island followed by another Jane Doe known as Peaches, whose partial remains were found in 1997. These murders came just two and three years after Bitrolf's known victims were murdered. Now, because Bitrolf wasn't apprehended until 2017, it's possible that he could have been active during the Long Island murders. Further linking Bitrolf to the Long Island serial killer's known victims is the fact that he lived in Manorville, close to where the remains of Jessica Taylor and Valerie Mack were found, and they were killed in 2000 and 2003, respectively. Also noted on the Wikipedia page on the Long Island serial killer is the fact that Bitrolf was a carpenter by trade, meaning he had access and was proficient with a wide array of power tools and just general tools Mm. now this is purely circumstantial but as some of the victims were quote precisely dismembered it is another potential link between Bitrov and some of the long island serial killers victims but it is not the strangest link Hmm. the daughter of rita tangredi Bitrov's first known victim was reportedly a close friend of Melissa Bartholomew, who, as we said last week, was one of the four victims found near Gilgo Beach in December 2010. Now, interestingly, around the time of Melissa's disappearance in July 2009, there were a lot of calls made to a number in Manorville from Melissa's mobile phone. As, of course, with the other suspects and people of interest in this case, John Vitrov has always denied involvement in any of the Long Island serial killer murders and he hasn't been charged with anything other than the two murders he was convicted of in 2017. Mm. But that is a a very strange link. Yeah. So along with these five men who are either suspects, people of interest, or who have at one time or another been a suspect or person of interest... Uh, There is another theory and another suspect sometimes associated with the Long Island serial killer case, and another potential victim. So the final potential victim, who we didn't talk about last week, is Tina Foglia, a 19-year-old woman who was last seen alive on February 1st, 1982 in West Islip, Suffolk County. She had been hitchhiking home after seeing a friend's band play at Hammerheads, a rock music venue in West Islip. Her dismembered body was found two days later wrapped in garbage bags alongside the Sagtaco State Parkway, 
close to the Robert Moses Causeway, which leads to Gilgo and Oak Beaches. Tina's diamond ring was found inside one of the bags, and DNA from an unknown male was also found inside one of the bags. Forensic genealogy and familial DNA testing is ongoing, but so far uh, the male has not been identified, and Tina Foglia's murder remains unsolved. Although Tina Foglia was murdered 14 years before the first victim of the Long Island serial killer, the Fire Island Jane Doe, uh, was discovered in 1996, we're not entirely sure when Fire Island Jane went missing or was murdered, and none of the sources we used gave any estimates. Mm. So it is possible that Fire Island Jane went missing many years before she was found and that the killer was active throughout the 80s and early 90s, as well as the established timeline of 96 to 2010. However, unlike the other victims, Tina was not known to be a sex worker, and so she disappeared in quite different circumstances to the known or other potentially other potential uh, Long Island serial killer victims. Mm -hmm. But hitchhiking still means you're a very vulnerable person alone at night. Yeah. Um, So early on in the LISC investigation, Tina was considered to be an early victim of a serial killer. And although law enforcement have not ruled that theory out, it is not currently an active part of the Long Island serial killer investigation. And that brings us on to the final suspect and an entirely different theory about the Long Island serial killer. Or killers. <laughs> so some have theorized due to the fact that the earlier victims were dismembered and disposed of in different locations and the later victims were dumped at the side of the road just out of view with no real care taken to hide them or make identifying them more difficult, like through dismemberment. So some think that this means there were two serial killers operating on Long Island throughout the 1990s and 2000s, possibly as far back as the 1980s. Working on this theory of two serial killers brings us to the final suspect, who we're going to talk about, convicted serial killer Joel Rifkin. Rifkin is believed to have committed 17 murders throughout New York and New Jersey between 1989 and 1993. Two of his victims have never been found, and two have never been identified. According to an article by All That's Interesting, Rifkin confessed to 17 murders after being arrested when he was pulled over as part of a routine routine traffic stop for having no license plate. He failed to stop and led officers on a high-speed car chase until state troopers on Long Island finally managed to apprehend him, and in doing so, they discovered the body of his final victim, Tiffany Bresciani, in the back of his pickup truck. At his trial in 1994, Rifkin was found guilty of nine of the 17 murders and sentenced to 203 years to life in prison. I think I know which is going to come sooner. Yeah, I think so. Uh, so Rifkin, like Petrov, remains in prison. Hopefully both of them will remain there until their deaths. And in an interview with Long Island Daily newspaper Newsday in 2011, Rifkin denied having anything to do with the Long Island murders. While the murder may have been speculating on Rifkin as responsible for some of the murders, and despite the fact that he tended to also target sex workers specifically, because they are more vulnerable and fall into the, you know, less dead category, which we talked about last week. It seems that law enforcement don't actually consider him a suspect or person of interest. Hmm. But he was apprehended in in 94. So that theory does only work if, like, Fire Island Jane and Peaches were killed quite a few years earlier than they were found yeah yeah um but some of rifkin's victims have not been found it's just he confessed to 17 but yeah. two of them have not been found one has not been found one of them who hasn't been found is also unidentified and then there's another one who has been found but remains unidentified so also it could be also that 
one of those Jane Doe's could be one of his victims that wasn't identified. Yeah. Uh, And that is the story of the Long Island serial killer, or what we know so far. So there haven't been any more victims found definitively linked to the case since what was it 20 2011 yeah. i think yeah that's interesting yeah cuz that implies that either like there's a there's few there's various reasons serial killers would stop mm-hmm. killing especially very prolific serial killers but two of the most common are they either dead or they're in prison. Yeah. Prolific serial killers don't tend to just stop. Yeah. I mean, they may I guess. Move. Well, that's the thing. Could be somewhere else as well, I suppose. Mm. Especially after sort of them finding all of these victims in one place. Yeah. Um, hmm. Interesting. As far as the public know which again what the public know and what the police know is is often very different there's never been like any dna or anything recovered mm-hmm. um because i have seen various articles about how they hope that forensic genealogy could help mm-hmm. in this case and while hopefully it will identify the victims if there's no dna yeah from the uh, murderer then it's not is it really going to help solve the case yeah probably not a few weeks ago i watched the crime scene Times square torso killer documentary series on netflix mm-hmm. and so uh i've forgotten his real name um the Times square torso killer somebody cutting him <laughs> was active from 67 to 1980 and some of his victims are still unidentified Mm -hmm. so there's so many serial killers especially from that period of like the 60s 70s 80s when there just seemed to be so many of them yeah there's still a lot of victims that are still unidentified some of joel rifkin's victims uh or known victims are still unidentified Mm -hmm. So, hopefully, like, forensic genealogy and things like that will help identify them, but there's such a backlog and so few people, like, there's not funding for it to be done professionally. These are just mostly people who do it off their own backs. Yeah, yeah. There's so few people who are trained um, or know how to do forensic genealogy po- properly. By the time all these victims get identified, if they ever get identified, will there actually be anyone around to bury them? Yeah, probably not, unfortunately. Which is a really sad, just a really sad state of affairs. Yeah. Yeah, and especially when there's just so many victims like in this yeah. case, that are probably connected, potentially connected, whatever you want to say, but like it's a lot. Yeah. I mean, there, there's 10 official victims, then there's others like Shannon Gilbert, and I think there's four or five others who we spoke about last week. That's a lot of people, a lot of families. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've definitely seen a series about this case. And I don't know if it was the Lost Girls one. Because it was a while back. Is it Killing Season by any chance? Or The Killing Season, something like that? There is a series on Prime which I haven't seen. I think there's yeah. an episode or two. Um. Yes, that's what it is. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It was good. Yeah, 2016. Mm. But one thing that actually surprises me is that this case is still relatively unknown. Yeah. 
I'm surprised it's not been more sensationalized or almost fetishized because we've got as we know obviously true crime is having a moment whatever you want to call it say it word it whatever and there's all these older cases usually about sex workers usually about women who've been violently murdered and dismembered and they're in, made into very sensationalized documentaries mm-hmm. and i'm surprised pleasantly surprised that this case hasn't received that kind of treatment yet yeah because it's got everything that like like the the time square torso killer documentary it's it's some you've got you've got all the you've got sex workers vulnerable women and a, a serial killer and potentially more than one serial killer and yeah i'm just surprised mm-hmm. that that it hasn't been sensationalized but i'm also not surprised that people don't know about it because it is the they are the less dead yeah i think also because it's not been solved or because there there's not as many sort of like solid suspects uh, i, I could suppose see yeah that like it'd be <laughs> it sounds terrible but like less appealing to make a you know a documentary about it Mm. because it doesn't make as good a story you know yeah um yeah yeah. the uh american serial killer documentary which as i said last week cannot find where it is (laughs) yeah now it was on channel four in the uk cannot find it anywhere else that was really interesting what it was all about the victims Mm-hmm. It was about, and especially uh, Amber Costello and her Amber Costello and her sister, who sort of talks a lot about how the sort of sex work industry works in regards to like Craigslist and Backpage, mm-hmm. which are both now uh, defunct, uh, or the erotic services part of Craigslist is defunct. Um, but there wasn't much. That I remember, I don't think there was much about like a pot- like who the potential killer was. It was about them and about how this industry worked and how they weren't protected and how they weren't important mm-hmm. to the public and to law enforcement. And like you say, because it's not solved, because there's not like so many crystal clear, like like really like concrete suspects. It's just a lot of it is circumstantial, which yeah. is still evidence, but you need both kinds of evidence in this kind of case. Yeah. If I remember but. correctly, that show, The Killing Season, it looks at the Long Island serial killer case. It also looked at like some other unsolved serial murders. I can't remember now, but I feel like they were trying to make the argument that like potentially there was a serial killer sort of moving throughout the country using the highway system yeah i've heard this theory quite a few times well because there has been there have been like interstate like the i-5 killer and stuff like that Mm. um but we i mean we've talked about this a lot before there's the danger in trying to be like okay all these killings are like the same method or exactly the same victim profile or something like that so they're all the same person and it's it's partly human nature because we don't like the thought that yeah oh there's so many serial killers on the loose i mean you don't need me to tell you this america is a very big place very big Yes, it is. And, like, for all these murders to have been committed all over the country by one person who, you know, has a a job that involves traveling throughout the highway and interstate systems, whatever, they'd have to be a very, very prolific murderer, which, of course, they could be. Mm. But for me, it still goes back to that twisting facts to suit theories not theories to suit the facts yeah no i mean i it seems like i 
there have surely been killers who have moved between states or areas, whatever, if you're not in the US. Well, um, Andrei Chikatilo yeah. in Soviet Russia. Yeah, there you go. He, he moved around on the trains for his job. That's how he was, how he managed to evade, well... There was a lot of cultural yeah. influences, but that is part of the reason he evaded capture for so long yeah. was that he wasn't just killing in his own locale. Or uh, Peter Tobin, who liked to go oh, on eight hour long road trips, you know, just for funsies mm. with his victims in the car, uh, <laughs> you know, but like, yeah. Yeah, so like surely that 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 has happened, that does happen, obviously. I don't know. It seems that these are particularly um connected to Long Island, especially yeah. Also it would be different if like the victims were from other places and they ended up in Long Island. Yeah. But, and it seems like investigators probably would have connected similar, like cases with super similar details in other areas. If like, you know, another X number of victims were found in a spot on the beach in South Carolina wrapped in burlap you know so yeah. and also the a lot of the victims all went missing in a very close period of time mm -hmm. so of sort of the later victims uh maureen brainerd vans went missing in 2007 melissa bartholomew 2009 shannon gilbert 2010 megan Watman 2010 and costello 2010 and then their remains were then found in December 2010 yeah um oh, sorry Shannon Gilbert's remains were found in 2011 but that's a very sort of it's compressed condensed yeah. timeline for them all to go missing and then be found yeah so yeah and like you say law enforcement especially if the FBI are involved yeah like, I just feel like if this was, if they were linked to some huge, like, prolific serial killer all over the country, the FBI should be able to make those links. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and like we've said before, like, there are many serial killers operating at any given moment. So, this is what happens when you try and, like, bunch it all together. Like, there's. There's not going to be one person responsible for all these murders all over the U.S. No, no. With such ver like, uh, okay, a majority of these are linked together in like the killing season. They're all sex workers, yeah. or mostly sex workers. But even if look at all the the victims who match this profile of being sex workers, potential, you know, like maybe they've got. Uh, addiction problems which quite a few of the LISC victims also had mm -hmm. things like that even if you've boiled it down to all the victims who fit that profile across the US you're still not going to have just one killer yeah and also like I mean that's what we've said from the start in this case that like the you know the killing season links cases because of the victimology because they were sex mm. workers but those are that is a, a more vulnerable population so yeah it, it make it it tracks then that they would be more likely to be victims in multiple different places in multiple different situations um unfortunately mm. as that is yeah I think that the mm. the police chief thing is interesting, if not necessarily that he's the killer, but more mm. that he potentially 
impeded or covered up the investigation. Yeah. Um, What's always easier to be a criminal where there are corrupt or at the very least inept yeah. law enforcement. Yeah. And that's, yeah. And that's the thing too. It's like, it may not be that he was involved, but all his other stuff that was going on made it easy for whoever was the murderer to just keep going. I don't think I have anything else to say. Other than it's just a very sad case and it's an indictment on how we treat vulnerable people. Yeah. In society, but is anything is it like ever gonna change? Because yeah, okay, we know more about them than we know about Jack the Ripper's victims, but the way general society looks at them is exactly the same. Yeah. But I don't know. I think you know, we talked a little bit about this last week, but like if if we can change the way the media portrays these types of events, these types of crimes, yeah. these types of victims, then you know, I think that that could go a long way. Mm-hmm. It's all about, you know, changing societal structures and traditions and and norms. And yeah. I think there's a potential to to make those changes. It's just a matter of if people want to make the effort to do it. And if and if the systems will allow it. Yeah. It's kind of a who sticks their head out the trench first. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because as you said, all these like all these big media companies have they have that kind of power. Mm, absolutely. To change the way we talk. I'm not expecting Fox News to start having sympathy for, you know, poor white, you know, poor people, poor pe- especially people of colour anything like that but there are still you know networks there are big major companies that have the power to change perceptions i mean but it, it's got to be a committed effort not just like a think piece during like the height of me too yeah i mean if if we've learned nothing else in the last you know six-ish years it's if the media has a message, it can it, it can drastically influence society. Yeah. Now that's not been happening for the better. Yeah. But it's do you use your powers for good or for evil? Yeah, exactly. So and I think unfortunately it's just one of those situations where like the quote unquote liberal media, the not mouth-foaming lunatic side of the media needs to like just get the guts and start doing things differently yeah until we start changing those opinions and those attitudes cases like this just aren't going to be solved and they aren't going to be a priority yeah and that's a very sad note to end on i think but I also think it's true. Yeah. If, by chance, you do have any information about the Long Island serial killer or may be able to help identify some of the still unidentified victims, please contact your local law enforcement, even if you're outside of the US, because they will be able to assist you via uh, Interpol and things like that. Or in the US, you can call Suffolk County Crime Stoppers on one 800 220 tips that number again is 1-800-220 tips i don't really understand how words work in phone numbers in america but (laughs) well wait okay wait yeah that's the phone it would be um 1-800-220-8477 right okay so yeah that's the number if you're in the US. Um, if you like the show and you want to share the love, you can rate and review us on your podcast app 
especially Apple Podcasts. And while you're there, why don't you go ahead and subscribe so you never miss a new episode. Um, and we have some Square Mile merch. Um, if you would like to to rep us in the streets. And you can... F- As I'm sure the kids do not say anymore. Definitely not, but that's okay. <laughs> um, and in fact, I got a request from uh, the podcast gremlin who has recently started listening <laughs> to this podcast on which she has mentioned so often. Uh, she wants a, and once again, we've solved nothing, shirt. <gasps> We we had a request from one of our patrons yeah, as well a we while did. ago about that. So, so I I, yeah. I told her I was like, "Deal, do you want to help design it?" <laughs> and she said, "Sure." So we're yeah. we're outsourcing. <laughs> <laughs> um. So you know maybe that's coming down the pipeline at some point or another. Um. So if you want to watch out for that, you can find the link to the merch show. Uh. Nope. The merch site. <laughs> In the show notes, or on our website, or by going to squaremileofmurder.store. And if you would like to help us cover the costs of making the podcast and help us invest in the future of the show, you can join our Patreon page, Tierstat, at just £1 per month. Every patron gets regular episodes one day early, a shout out on the show when you join, priority case requests, and a lifetime discount on merch. And that's just for £1 a month. As the tiers go up, you get even more, including bonus episodes and exclusive little stationary merch that you can't buy anywhere. So check all that out at patreon.com forward slash square mile of murder. Links are in all the usual places. And finally, this week, the blog is coming back. <laughs> Yay. Because we keep forgetting. Yeah. Um. So yeah, that is also on Patreon, but it's free. Yes. Uh. Just patreon.com forward slash square mile of murder. I think if you want to comment or anything, you have to have an account, but you don't have to pay. Yeah. And also, I, cause when I was uploading something to Patreon the other day, I think you can follow a creator on Patreon. I know you can because I do it personally without paying to them. So you can hmm. still get notified when there's like new posts and stuff, especially oh. like free, like open stuff so if that's something you want to do you can do that too so yeah um so, yeah we will be back next week next week very excited yeah next week next week's episode i'm very excited about that so that's coming next week and we'll uh we'll see you all then yeah yeah thanks for listening bye bye